Good morning. My name is Nikki Monroe. I am the environmental horticulture agent and master gardener coordinator here in Indian River County. I am currently living my very, very best life. And I love my partnership with the folks at Busy Bee because they give me an opportunity to fondle their plants and teach other people about them. What's not to like, right? And I get to give away gift cards. Like, this is really great. I get to get a good name. <laughs> All right, so we are here today to talk about shade gardening. And I enjoy discussing shade gardening, especially with the skeptics because I get them to have a sheet of paper and I let them sit down and they're like, there are so many more options available than just sadness and unhappiness. There, there, there is color in the shade, right? There are many opportunities to make your life so much easier in the shade in Florida. All right, so one of the things I want to encourage you all to think about from now is green and bright color are all possible, especially down here in hot, humid Florida, all right? Those are the two things that I want you to think about and to take away from this lecture. If you don't think of anything else, shade can yield green and bright color. Now, how you're gonna get that done is a different story. I was very deliberate today in the ways that I'm showing you all ways to get this done because I never want to give you a pie in the sky option because what is good advice if you cannot take it? Exactly. And I am not here to hear myself talk, right? So let's talk about what shade is classified as. So in the plant world, we say that shade is four or fewer hours of full direct overhead sun without anything breaking it up. That is shade, okay? That is considered shade. Dappled shade, like what we have underneath this all day long, that is shade. High shifting shade, so if you're out in the scrub areas, if you're in a slash pine area where the shade just tracks along with the sun because of the pine trees, that is also still shade because there's something interrupting that sunlight from that spot directly throughout the day. So that is also considered shade, okay? Then there is something called difficult shade. And all of you are gonna be like, yes, that's what I've got. You, pro you most likely just have shade. You don't really have difficult shade, but you don't know it's not difficult because you haven't been here before. And you haven't got, come to one of my lectures on shade before, right? So this is dense and dark and there's like almost zero sun, okay? So, um, for those parts of your landscape that there is a north wall that is blocking that area from ever getting direct sunlight, ever, ever, right? So it's not four or fewer hours. It's not an oak tree that allows the, the shade to, the, the light to sprinkle on through. I recommend mulch. I recommend yard art. I recommend that you do something different other than putting plants into an area that there is no light. That's gonna reduce your frustration with that space. And it's also gonna give you another way to look at that area. It's easy to put up a sign there that says, here lies Mo, he trespassed and we had to compost him, right? That's, that's a place for you to be really cheeky and kind to yourself. You're not gonna grow anything but algae very well in that spot. So just, just Subject that to a seating area. And we all need seating areas without the blazing sun of Florida on top of our heads in that area, right? So there are other things that you should repurpose that space for other than growing or trying to grow something in that place. Does that make sense to you? Yes, I love that for us. All right, now, um, there are other difficulties that we encounter in shade that are completely things that we can work around. So this live oak is going to have an extensive root system. Yes? I've not put many things over there that require a significant amount of digging. 
Most of the things that I want you all to put in the ground are in very small pots for the simple reason that you can put a shovel on the ground, step on it, rock it back and forth a wee bit, and make enough space to drop one of those plants in and walk away. There are two really great things about using smaller plants. One of those great things is this. They will grow up, all right, and they cost less. The second great thing about it is it's going to take you less time and effort to keep on going out there and watering them in for them to establish properly. And that's where I insert the natives and non-natives still need to be properly established before you can just walk away from them. Okay? Natives are not going to work unless you put in the work. Establish them properly, please. And then let them be as low maintenance as you want them to be. All right? But all of your options that I have out here today are supposed to be low maintenance, they're supposed to be easy to take care of after you've established them. Have a game plan for that establishment. Don't go on vacation after you've put out 100 plants underneath the live oak tree. Question yourself about why you put 100 plants underneath the live oak tree. <laughs> All right? Great. Now, um, you can put a lot of your cold, tender plants in the canopies of your trees. So that's the reason why a lot of times when we have temperature drops in Florida, a lot of the veteran um, growers here, they don't go and rescue their orchids that they have tied into the trees. You're gonna cause more issues with that. They don't go and take the ones that are hanging in the trees out. They know that, that, that under that tree canopy, there's a, brand, there's a different microclimate that has been established. And it's usually warmer under there than it is in the rest of their landscape. And since this is October, this is my opportunity to say to you that when you're engaging in your gardening activities for right now, consider what you're gonna do for the colder weather. Do not laugh, we get cold weather, okay? Especially since this is central Florida, we get cold weather, okay? So you're gonna water your landscape in the morning before you know there's going to be a snap. That's going to create a battery that is going to absorb as much of the solar radiation as possible. And if you're like me, you can get up at 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning with your cup of coffee and watch the steam coming up off of your landscape just at those hours of the night when, it's, when the temperature is supposed to be like at 30 some odd. You'll see that steam coming up and doing what it's supposed to do. So that even if you lose some leaves, your roots are still going to be there, all right? So it's not, we're no longer sprinkling overnight. Overhead irrigation is only good for bromeliads and turf grass, all right? You're going to water, you're going to soak your plants in overnight, in, in first thing in the morning, and then overnight, whatever heat was stored is going to come up for you. All right, so back to shade gardening because it still pertains to them. So if you've got your orchids and your bromeliads underneath your live oak tree or you've got other things in your underneath your live oak tree you're going to soak that area and allow that to be the blanket that it's supposed to be it's going to enhance that space okay all right um so there are many plant options let's talk about turf grass right let's talk about the ways that most turf grass varieties that are made for shade are only shade tolerant. Think about your least favorite three-year-old cousin when you were 17 and 18 who just wanted to come up to you with their grubby hands because they thought you were the very best thing on the face of the earth. You tolerated that human being. Did you enjoy your engagement with them? Not really, right? But you tolerated them. That is what shade tolerance is in turf grass. It is not we're going to have this verdant thing underneath this live oak tree. Do they have a verdant thing underneath this live oak tree? No, it is very sparse over here, right? That's the same thing, even if it's engineered to tolerate shade. So there are two things that you need to, keep, to take away from this with that. If you're going to go that direction, fine. Keep it mowed at its highest no matter what time of the year it is. So whatever the highest level for that turf grass is, that is where you're gonna keep that mode. And the second thing is, 
fertilizer, and water are not substitutes for sunlight. It is not going to do excessively better if you over-irrigate and you over-fertilize that turf. Know what it is you're growing and take care of it the way that we say to take care of it. We engineered it. We're the ones who can say, keep it at four inches, water it at this stage, fertilize it seldom. And that is not the turf grass that you want to play soccer under. That is not the turf grass that everybody is going to be running on, right? That's not the area for that. And that is also not the place that you want your pets to use for the bathroom. That's not the turf that you want to do that with. Because all of those are going to leave you coming into my office saying, I got shade tolerant turf and it still looks very, very sparse. And that's when we're going to have a, a conversation about alternatives for green things in your shade space. Because most of us just want something green. Because green is a soothing color. It is a color of comfort. But we default to grass because that's what we know. So I want you to learn and to be introduced to different things that are still going to give you green in that shade space. That's still going to give you bright in that shade space. But it will not give you the fits and the conniptions that, that it's currently giving you right now, right? So um, one of those things are alternative ground covers, right? So many people don't do much underneath their live oaks. Or, or any of their other shade trees is, is this thing that you drive past in the driveway, you say hello to it, and you're like, hi, goodbye, and you walk into the house, right? It's not where you have the barbecue grill. It's not, it's just, it's just standing there. So if you're not doing much underneath that tree, then Asiatic jasmine can be something that you want to put underneath there, or you want to put an ivy underneath there. There are many options for just something green that runs on the ground. If you're not out there doing a lot, you're not going to be concerned about walking on it. You don't have to worry about how it feels underfoot because you're, it's not going to be under your foot, right? Um, another thing for you to think about is why not turn that into a showpiece if you're not going to be playing around with it, if you're not going to be concerned about someone kicking a soccer ball over there? Why not turn it into a showpiece? Put some ground orchids over there. Put some geraniums underneath there. Of course, the geraniums, I want to keep mine in pots because they're not going to persist, right? Um, the begonias, they are rock stars under my live oaks. When I tell you they do not want to die, they have a will to live because I've been busy and they're still alive, okay? So begonias, and I've got the variegated liriope over there, that just brightens it up. You can see the leaves of those, right? So what your, your focus is supposed to be on, what can I see in the shade? I've used pots of varying colors up here. I chose not to use any of the darker, darker colors because you don't want a disembodied plant underneath your shade. But the bright colors of the pots that I'm using here is a really, really low maintenance, easy to access way of adding color in your shade spaces, right? So that was a thing that um, I helped two of my master gardeners who can no longer get down to the ground, but have really beautiful seating areas in their landscapes. And they were like, Nikki, the season is coming in. You keep, okay, so I henpeck them sometimes. I nag them sometimes because they forget that I'm the one in my 40s still. And they're the ones in their late 70s, mid 80s. What are you doing out there like that? Please assess your situation and act accordingly. I have to manage the ways that I get down on the ground. I have a crawling pad. Okay, it's my yoga mat. But... It's being used these days, right? I have repurposed this thing that was judgmental in the corner of my, la of, of my living room. It is now my crawling mat, and my youngest son thinks it's hilarious. It might have been a gift from him, but who, you know, anyway, I digress. So I showed them 
that it is easy. Now, the pots that I've selected are very heavy. They're very sturdy. They are there for the duration. But we went and got them some very light. They have some huge light pots here. We filled it halfway up with mulch because that takes up a lot of the space. And then we put the things that we really, really are very invested in the middle. We're heavily in love with these plants and they're gonna stay there forever and ever, amen, like the anthuriums, okay? And then what I did was we got a couple of coleus put around it and we put those in amongst the trees. They were easy, easy to do and they were ready for season. The other thing with that is when they decided they wanted to do picnics, we could just pick them up and put them on the tables as huge centerpieces, right? So you got to make a really good little plan. Think about all of the ways that you can get 180% out of the things that you're, that you're doing. Because who has time to be out here arguing with nature, arguing with their landscape, when you can be going to brunch? Mimosas are magnificent, right? Yes, so that is what I'm here to encourage you to do. I did pots a few years ago like this. This same size, you have one little spill plant, you have one little thrill plant, and you, you, you pin the spill plant all the way around the edge of the pot, and it fills it completely up, right? So I used Creeping Jenny, and I used... Um, the silver stuff, the dichondra, pinned it around the edges of the pot, two plants in one little itty bitty pot. And we could transfer them from the tables outside or on the ground outside to table centerpieces. Easy peasy, not a problem. And I had to do that because we had four meetings during season and I didn't have time. And neither did my volunteers. We were we legit had three events on one day. Talk about stretch, right? So we had to make it work. I'm encouraging you all to think about five and six different ways that you can use the things that you invest your time, your money, and your effort into, even if it is in the shade spaces of your landscape, all right? Now, um, let's talk about plant selections, okay? Um, oh, one plant for, that's a really great alternative that you don't end up sharing with your neighbors if they don't want them. Cast iron plant, super deep green leaf, and it will spread, honey, it will spread. It will spread out underneath that live oak tree. They will drink beer and they will carouse all the rest of the year without you having to interfere with them at all, okay? and. I put a mixture of cast iron plant and the purple ground orchid and the ground orchids that have the yellow and orange flowers underneath one of my volunteers' live oak trees. And she thinks I'm a rock star now. I'm so pleased because I needed those brownie points. <laughs> I really did. You know, but these are the things that you can do to make your life easier and er add curb appeal, you're gonna want to drive up and see that live oak when you get back, right? Every single time you're gonna be like, and I did that, that was my great idea. Those were the plants that I selected. It's gonna be wonderful, all right? Um, so anthuriums, these are good for indoors and outdoors. They, they sit well in pots. I don't put them in the ground because they want a richer soil than we have in, our, in the ground. So I put them in pots, all right? Now, um, the same thing with the peace lilies. I keep them in pots. I have one in my office. It is eking out its existence in my office. I'm a little weird when it comes to the things that I manage in my office. I try to see what's gonna kill them um, because I need to be able to tell people this, these are the conditions in my office, and if this is your condition at home, this is not the plant for you, right? The conditions in my office is excessively low light, and it's very, very cold. It's doing well in the foyer of the office, but not in the corner of my office. So that is something for you to consider, but it transfers indoors and outdoors without missing a beat. 
because I had to take the one that I almost completely killed in my office. It's hanging out underneath my live oak tree near my rabbit, Roger. And they talk bad about me when I'm not there, but it's okay. They confess afterwards. Give them a couple of minutes after five o'clock, they'll tell you everything that they've ever done or said. Now, if you want some really nice natives to put underneath your live oak trees, um, some of the bigger plants that you can consider that I think is a great co combination, beautyberry. It has super bright, like lime green leaves that you're going to see underneath a live oak. And then its other best friend that comes with all of the tricks is the wild coffee. That has a deep green colored leaf, right? It is it is a super green leaf. You're not, it's not what they teach you in kindergarten, like you can't get green things in shade. Wild Coffee says, hold my beer. It is super duper duper green in that shade space, right? And they like to hang out. And if you're a bird watcher, if you're a, a wildlife enthusiast, those are the two plants that you wanna put down there in that shade. They don't mind being right up under the armpit of your tree. However, getting them under the armpit of the tree is going to be a different story. So you want to take them out just a wee bit so that you can at least get your shovel in, rock it back and forth, and put in your plant. Now, a lot of places only sell them in three gallons, but even a little further out along the drip line of the tree is still going to be a good spot for those plants, okay? Um, Lady palms are over there. They spread. They're not necessarily invasive. I will not say that to you. They're not going to go and share themselves with your neighbor who does not want them. They, but they do branch out. They do become many. So one plant goes a very long way if you have a long-term plan and a budget that you want to stay within the constraints of. And while they are doing their thing, it is easy to put a few coleus a couple of begonias that are very inexpensive into that space along with them. And as they expand on out, you can just let the rest of the things just move along with them. Does that make sense? Yes, great. All right, um, who likes hosta? I do too, oh my God. I went to Connecticut a few years ago and there was this lady who was the president of the Hosta Society and the person I was with knew her. Why did we spend almost a whole entire day in that lady's yard with me doing this? Just that, right? Okay, so for you all who, we only have Sun Hosta here, they eke out their existence, they try their best, they do a really good job, right? They're, they're okay-ish. There's peacock ginger that you should consider. There's also calathea that you sh should consider because the leaves are similar. And that's what we really like hosta for, right? Hosta is not anything for, like we don't like them for their height. We don't like them for their, what flower? We want them for their leaves. So hosta down here, for those of us who adore them, get you a couple of peacock gingers, put them in pots, not because they'll run away from you, but because they're better, they're, they're easier to manage in pots and you can change out the soil and feed them regularly the way that they deserve to be treated, right? Now for those, I would put them in a wider pot, a shallow pot, okay? And for those of us who are going to be doing a lot of this as a container garden, please remember if your pot is less than 12 inches, try to change out that soil annually. It's okay, I get that same response from most of the groups that I teach. Try to change the soil out of your, tw if it's less than 12 inches, try to change it out annually, all right? If it's bigger than 12 inches, try to at least, I mean, go for it. Try to at least change out half of the soil every two years because your plants are going to deplete that soil if you're doing something right with it, okay? And don't be like my friend Bob, who told me that he had the palm trees in his pots for over 10 years on stretch. I love his stick to but that's probably the reason why they got mealy bugs that came in to that stress response signal. The, the palms were like, hey, we have done everything that we can do to survive. We need your assistance. 
And the mealybugs were like, say less. I'm here to help you, right? And so the mealybugs are attacking the palm trees that, that need the help to die, right? They're like, please come do your job. I am ready to go, right? So when I told him that he needed to repot them, he was like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, dude, they've gotten everything they can out of that soil, surely. You're going to see nothing but root system when you pull them out of the pots, right? So, and, and you might have to destroy those pots. Who knows? I'm just, I've used the, um, you know those baker's things that are very, very thin? It kind of looks like the thing that you jimmy windows with. You can scrape them along the edges of those pots if, 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 and it might help. But sometimes, unless you intend to do that for the whole day, you need to come up with a more sustainable idea, right? Now, I will admit to you all that there are times that there are plants that I know are only going to last for the season. I don't even take them out of the pots. I drop them in container, in container, and I let those roots sneak back out at the bottom, and I call it a day because they're not going to make it. It's not like they're going to be there forever and ever, amen. So unless it's like a penta that I, pentas want to live, but they're, they're for full sun, y'all. Don't put them into dense shade. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a good look, right? All right. So let's talk about the other things that are going to bring light in your shade spaces. Bulbs. Literally, bulbs. All right. So agapanthus. Love it. Amaryllis, crinums, and if you have a sunken place in your landscape that has a lot of water, crinums are your friend. And if you have a friend with crinums, they're going to want to share them with you. Just smile at them politely and be like, I will take all 10 of these, and then in two or three years, you're going to have 50 of them to share with somebody else, all right? And be a good friend. Identify those water-holding, shaded spaces in your friend's landscapes and be like, hey, have I got a tip for you? Not only have I got a tip for you, but I can even give you the plants that it takes. They are going to make you the best brunch ever. And don't forget, French toast is delicious with a little juge of ginger as well, okay? Not just cinnamon and nutmeg. Ramp it up. Just a, just a smidge of ginger, right? Set your world on fire. All right. Um, hurricane lilies. I have one in a pot. It is eking out its existence because it was abandoned on my deck step. I did not know it was there. And I found out three weeks ago that it was. That is to say to you all, I may or may not have the landscape I truly desire to have, but it is a work in progress. And my volunteers, they're sweet. They show up with things. They don't text me and say, hey, look what I left you. All right. Um, and then there are many native varieties of bulbs, inc including the crinum americana, that will do well in shade spaces. OK. Um, so let's talk about my four tips for you to have a great experience. And I've already told you a few of them, right? The first tip is be kind to yourself. Set the right expectations and goals for yourself. That's a big old oak tree. Don't do the whole thing at once. Do one section, pat yourself on the back if it lasts for the year. You did a great job. You deserve to go get yourself a treat from whatever store you think is awesome, right? Just do one section and do it well. My orchid was in the back. His orchid room in the back, right? So that is, that is a thing for you to think about. Don't, don't try to get the whole entire tree done. Don't try to take over your whole entire shade space. Make a plan for the whole shade space and then just eat that elephant bite by bite, right? So be kind to yourself. That's my first tip. My second tip is light colored flowers, light colored leaves. You're going to see them in a distance, right? I chose the begonias that have very, very light colors. 
I didn't choose any of the deep reds. I didn't choose any of the leaves that are very, very dark for this exercise because I want you all to see, to notice how your eyes are attracted to them, right? I chose the crossandras that have super rich color leaves and those bright colored flowers. You're not gonna be able to miss them. And they check off, do I have green? Yes. Is it thriving? Absolutely. And did I get a bright color that I can see in that space? Yes, right? All of those things choose pots that are brightly colored. Unless you have a sense of humor like me and you just want people to think that you have a floating garden, right? <laughs> that is also another thing. But for the most part, I have chosen bright colored fla pot, flower pots, right? I haven't chosen anything that when you're walking by it, you're going to hit your foot into it because you did not see it in the shade. You're definitely going to see that yellow. You're going to see the rim of this bright colored pot. You're going to see all of the colors underneath the bottom of that pot. So no matter what I put in that pot, it was going to enhance that space regardless. Everything that you do in your shade garden must check off three and four and five boxes, but it's going to be instantaneous. It's not going to be as, you're not going to have to sit down there with a checklist and say, did this. As soon as you pick it up, you're going to be like, yep, buzzing. This is at least three, four, or five of them right here in this one pot, right? In this one plant. That is what you want. These pots are big enough for you to put them on the ground and not stump your toe, but they're small enough to pick up and put on a table for a centerpiece. All right? Those are the things that you want to consider. All right. Um, another tip that I have for you all is get friends. Have friends come over. I sent out some very cheeky invitations with a variety of plant leaf shapes. And I, t I invited three of my favorite people to come over and do pots with me, right? Get some friends to come over. And whether or not you're doing potted gardens for, for your shade gardening ex exercises, or if you're just doing that one little section of your tree that, that you want, that you say to yourself, this is going to be the best for my effort, go for it. But don't go at it alone. Exchange with your friends. Say, hey, guys, this week is my weekend. I've already gotten my plant material. This is the game plan. Come on over. It's going to take five of us one hour to do this. And then we can go have drinks on the terrace. Or it would take you two or three hours to do it all by yourself. And then you won't get a chance to laugh at the person who fell over. I'm that person, by the way. Um, right? So invite friends. Do this not as a solitary thing, because I think we've all had enough of solitary things to last us all a lifetime. This is a great opportunity to reach out and have more people around you and to be in community with more people. Does that make sense? Great. So those are my tips. Did I get to number four? Did I do them all? I think I did. Oh, and when you're pot gardening, don't overfill your pots because this can't be your whole life. All right. For a four inch pot, that's one plant that you really, really want everybody to know that you have. That's going to be your, yeah, I got that. Isn't it cute? And it's really easy to take care of because all I did was just tip a little bit of water into it and I walked away, right? And it doesn't have to be anything more amazing or rare than one of these. That's not rare. But can that go in its own pot and be amazing on its own? Yes. That's easy to do. That's really, really wonderful. Don't overfill your pots. Don't overthink your pots. They all need shade? Great. How much water does it need? Are, are their watering needs similar? Yes. Do they have the same fertilizer requirements? Yes. They can all hang out together. Okay? I didn't overfill this pot because of what's in it. They're not going to over multiply. Okay? They're not. They're very slow growing if you're growing them correctly. 
And every time that you're going to have to redo that pot because it's a shallow pot, you can just put the same plants back in. And if, it, and if they made new ones, then you get to be Madam or Mr. Generosity to your friends. They're going to love you for it. All right. So don't overfill your pots because you don't want to be tethered to them for watering duties. And all of these things you're going to need to water from the bottom or put the water into the soil. The, none of these things want overhead watering. All right. That is the cause of much disease proliferation. You don't want to overhead water them. You want to soil water them. Right. So you can get yourself a wand, tuck the wand in there, and keep on, you know, like a bee, just dot your plants. I take a container and I set my plants down into it. I sip my coffee. I let my chickens talk trash. I let my rabbit give me the little stink eye sometimes. I really do shade garden in my landscape. And then I put the pot out and I move on from there. Either that or I bribe my best friend's grandchildren with brunch, yes, and they come over and they water my plants correctly and I leave them be. I also recycle water bottles. I put about three or four holes into a water bottle. I fill up the water bottle, I cap it off, that creates a vacuum that lets less water trickle out. I put the water bottle into the pot and I uncap it and it drips out the water. I sip my coffee, I feed my chickens, I talk with my rabbit, I collect my empty water bottles afterwards, and I, my plants are watered, my chickens are fed, my rabbit is still fat and sassy, and my plants are watered. It's a really great life, right? Try to think of ways that you can make your life easier. This is not supposed to be an exercise in hardship, okay? Begonias are very inexpensive, so is the Aztec grass. Two of them in one pot, Bob's your uncle. Simple. It makes a really great centerpiece. They do well in the ground underneath your plants. They do well in pots. Very, very easy. You do not have to put yourself through a lot of stress and fatigue. And I am here to help you. So if you tell me, Nikki, I really, really like deep, rich colors, I can give you at least five plants to go and put underneath your trees. That is what I am here for. I am your extension agent, all right? If you say to me, hey, Nikki, I really want as much light as possible underneath my live oak tree, then I'm going to tell you to put in the variegated liriope. I'm going to tell you to put in the begonias that have that light leaf and light flower, so I have the ones with the white flowers over there in those containers as well. And then I'm going to say to you, how bright do you want it? Because this is a bright color, right? And the leaves are nice and rich. This is a bright color. So I also have this up here. That does not go in the ground. Don't put it in the ground. Be kind to yourself and your neighbors if you really want to keep them as your friends. That stays potted. It should stay in a pot that does not have any root contact with the soil. So if, the, if your pot has a drainage hole, put it on a paver. Because when that escapes, there's no coming back. And you don't want that, OK? And that is a plant that even if you share it with a really great friend of yours, share my caution with that really great friend of yours as well. Please encourage them to keep it potted. That is not ever supposed to hit bare soil outside. That is an invasive plant. That is a plant that you'll see climbing up with huge leaves over there. You're never going to tame that shrew. Okay? So avoid that circumstance for yourself. If you're going to have it, keep it in a pot. All right, but I don't know what it's called here. Do they have a name tag on it? I call it pothos. I don't see a name tag for it, but it is really, really good for leaf, right? It's beautiful in a pot. I had to help someone who was very attached to theirs at a condo association 
take some pieces, make some clones when it had to be removed because they were going for a Florida friendly certification and that was one of many invasives in one space. And I just could not overlook it. So that condo owner came out and was like, but that's mine and I, and I was like, I understand completely and I'm not telling you to get rid of it. I'm telling you to keep it in a different way. You can have everything you want. I am here to say yes to every single thing you want. How you have it is a different conversation to be had, right? And that is why I'm here. Florida Friendly Landscaping is about you having all of your needs met as beautifully as possible with the lowest impact to your wallet, to your sense of aesthetics, and to our environment, right? That's what Florida Friendly is. So that's, you can have your plants. Like I had another one with the snake plant, mercy. And if you ever want a management nightmare, baby, that's the one for you. We gathered up a significant tranche of them. I put them into a huge pot for her because they will sit in the pot for two or three years and not care, right? And then I gave her just a little ring around that with some pentas. And she was like, I actually like this better. So there are so many ways that everyone can have all the things that they want and need because beauty is a need. Beauty is not an extra. Beauty is a need, right? So let's make our shade spaces more beautiful. Let's make sure that we're we're doing all the things that we can in the easiest way possible. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want, right? You all are not here for me to say to you, shade is impossible, especially with the heat and the humidity here in Florida. That's a lie. But that's the impression that you would get without adequate information, right? That's the impression that you would have. Mm -hmm.